Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the cinema of the German Film Institute and Film Museum, and to our very special evening here program from the lecture and film series, um, which, as you probably already know, will run until July next year, um, dedicated to the Belgian filmmaker Chantal Ackermann. Um, just as a reminder, you probably already know, but we, you can see the whole program of this series in the little flyer that we have here with the whole program until July, so you can already put the special um, the dates in your calendars. Um, but every month we also try to have some extra screenings. So either we are repeating the same films that we have at the lecture in a different date for people who can't come or who want to see the film again, or we're showing other films to complement the program. So this is not like a steady thing, so it's going to be different from one month to the next. So that's why I wanted to also recommend you to always have a look in the monthly program of the Film Museum, because there it's going to be like the full program for that month everything that we're showing on top of the, um, the usual uh, lecture um, dates that you will find here. So, uh, so much about that. We are very honored tonight to have uh, one of the specialists, one of the first people to uh, write about Chantal Ackermann, Yvonne Magulis. And uh, to introduce her, we have here uh, Daniel Fairfax, teacher from the Institute of Theater, Film and Media from the Goethe University. Um, and he'll be speaking about uh, Yvonne here shortly. And just as a short reminder, I, as always, we're going to have first the lecture, then a short break, about 10 or 15 minutes. You can still buy uh, something to drink at the cafe in the foyer. And then, of course, the screening of the film of tonight, Le Rendezvous d'Anna. And after the film, we have, as always, the Q&A and the chance to ask questions, both about the lecture and about the film. So I hope many of you will stay for that and uh, enjoy your evening. Thanks for coming. Uh, okay, thanks, Laura, uh, for that introduction, and now my introduction. Um, perhaps st I will start by echoing Laura's sentiment that uh, I don't think any series dedicated to Chantal Ackerman's work would really be complete without the presence of Yvonne Margulis. Um, as the author of probably the f first uh, monograph on Ackerman in any language, I'm guessing, um, yep. Uh, Nothing Happened, Chantal Ackerman's Hyperrealist Every Day uh, from 1996. Uh, the book had uh, its origins in uh, Yvonne's uh, doctoral work at uh, New York University. Um, and if you don't mind me retelling kind of some of the circumstances of your choice to uh, focus on Ackerman, uh, she uh, had originally conceived the work uh, as a kind of broader discussion of the role of time and duration in, in cinema and focused across four different filmmakers or, and artists, let's say, uh, Andy Warhol, Jean-Luc Godard, Wim Wenders, and Chantal Ackerman. It's a very it's a grand collection of you know, world-renowned artists. Uh, and she was speaking to another friend of the Deutsches Film Museum, uh, Ishmael Xavier, who was here last year for um, the uh, Tropicalia series. Uh, and Ishmael said, first of all, drop Wim Wenders. Uh, which is a wise piece of advice to anyone. Uh, don't focus on inventors. But then he said, no, but focus on Chantal Ackerman because that's where work needs to be done. Uh, that's what, you know, Warhol's been done, Goddard's been done, but Chantal Ackerman, that's someone who really needs to have a deep uh, focus on their work. So Ivan uh, took up that advice and the result was Nothing Happens, which I think is a fundamental contribution, uh, not just to uh, our understanding of Chantal Ackerman, but even our understanding of the cinema as a whole. And I think... Uh, its influences can be really felt uh, not just in the world of film studies uh, or you know, art history and theory, but also in actual artistic practices. Um, its discussion of what makes Chantal Ackerman's cinema unique and the role particularly of time and duration in that cinema, uh, I think um, has had its effects on, on, on later artistic practice. And I think you know, the, the, cin the, the cinema and visual art of the last 20 years has really uh, that has been such a huge uh, element of uh, that practice. Um, so, so that uh, work is fundamental, uh, but uh, Yvonne has also been uh, very much productive uh, since then. She's also the editor of uh, the fundamental anthology, Rights of Realism, Essays on C Corporeal Cinema, which includes a, a range of different texts, um, 
focused on this kind of question of filmic realism, uh, but also on this on the the bodily level, the corporeal level. Uh, this you know a highlight of that collection is also her own essay uh, titled "Exemplary Bodies: Reenactment in Love in the City, Sons, and Close Up." Uh, and interestingly enough, I think her work you know continues to focus on uh, some of the uh, some of the topics uh, that were addressed in those in those earlier works. She's written widely, of course. She's written on, on other filmmakers, John Cassavetti, Sean Rouge, uh, Eric Romer. Uh, she's also written on uh, film theorist Andre Bazan, part of the Unpitting Bazan uh, project, um, edited by uh, Dudley Andrew and Hervé Joubert Laurencin. But she's also returned to, to those original topics. Uh, she co edited a special issue of uh, Film Quarterly on Chantal Ackerman in 2016. Um, so, you know, this is. Um, you know, a, a key kind of moment in, in let's say, Ackerman's uh, reception, given you know, the biographical uh, circumstances at the time. And she is actually also uh, very soon coming out with a new book titled In Person, Reenactment in Postwar and Contemporary Cinema, uh, which will be released by Oxford University Press on December 5th. So basically a week from now. Shame it couldn't be brought forward a week, so we could all grab a copy, but do go out and purchase that uh, whatever way you can, online or wherever. Maybe the bookshop here will stock a copy, who knows. Um, finally, Yvonne Margulies is a full professor uh, of film and media studies in uh, Hunter College in New York. So she's been based in New York essentially since her doctoral studies. Um, and she will be presenting to us today the, a talk entitled Ackerman's Meetings with Anna and the Serial Monologue Film. So join me in welcoming Yvonne Margulies. Hi, everyone. I uh, wanted to thank, um, first of all, Vincent uh, Hediger uh, for inviting me uh, to be part of this series. It's, it's a pleasure uh, to be here in Frankfurt. And I wanted to thank uh, Danny uh, Fairfax and uh, Laura for um, setting up and also uh, Pradiba. Um, so thanks a lot. Um, I, I forgot to mention to you, Danny, but my book has been translated to, into Spanish, the Ackerman book. So if anyone here is a Spanish speaker, now you can read it in Spanish. So I'm very pleased, and in Portuguese as well. Um, okay, um, so um, for a number of commentators, including Jean-Luc Godard, uh, the film we're going to be seeing, It is with Anna, was Ackerman's most conventional. Uh, she made it in 78, and of course, the Jean Dillman was the big marker there, and the radicality of the film made everything kind of seem uh, tame in comparison. Um, he felt uh, he was basically, I guess, annoyed with the Gaumont uh, backing of the film and the production values. He felt that she was kind of selling out, making a very conventional film. Um, in part, I want to here to talk about her aesthetic contribution, which I think is unique to this film, uh, given that uh, you'll be, if you're coming to all the presentations, you, of course, are going to have an overview of all the Ackerman uh, work, but I try to focus on what's specific to this film, what's her ambitious, uh, uh, particular ambitious for uh, this film. And in the second part of the presentation, just very shortly, I want to place uh, this film within a film genre I've defined as a serial monologue film, um, which is basically uh, one person talking for a long time while the other listens quietly. Um, given Ackerman's ambitions for meetings with Anna, it is appropriate that we consider her work in relation to this other mode of address, where the dramatic form of dialogue mutates to serve rhetorical or didactic purposes. So Meetings with Anna presents Ackerman's aesthetic trademark, a simple narrative presented with a high degree of visual and oral order. The film's linear narrative is structured around a series of meetings between the protagonist and five other people as she travels from Paris to Essen in Germany and back. Each encounter involves one or more long conversations with Anna, who mostly listens empathetically. We presume the protagonist is a filmmaker of independent films, much like Ackerman. 
She's never seen filming, but is constantly in transit and always silently resisting any demand that she establish roots or get married. At the time she was making the film, she read Deleuze and Guattari Kafka toward a minor literature and felt many of their collocations on a nomadic condition, a deterritorialized relation to native language, applied not only to Kafka's dry literature, but also to her own filmmaking. One of the relevant traits of a minor literature, such as Kafka practices in German, is the minoritarian condition of the writer uh, emerging in a new configurations of personal and collective amalgams and uh, hybrids. Ackerman stated that her character's nomadism and celibacy free her to move away from usual system of possession, from conservative values. But as important for this discussion, she suggested that Anna's movement triggers a larger cultural and historical resonance. And I read here, behind the insignificant events that Anna, the character, uh, will be told about, we shall see the shape of great collective events, the history of countries, the history of Europe, and its last 50 years. So Meetings with Anna is about contemporary 70s Europe, but it was also at the time of its release in 78, Ackerman's most Jewish film. The European ground mapped by Anna is part of a longer Jewish historical trajectory consistently present in the filmmaker's work. This path from Eastern Europe to the US is symptomatic of a nomadic sensibility attuned to a particular cultural and historical background, and news from home, dust from the East from 93, and American stories, history, philosophy, and food have insisted on the history beneath this migrant geography with a specific significance in Ashkenazi Jewish history. Since this, Ackerman became increasingly explicit about her particular sensitivity to the Holocaust, and each of her subsequent documentaries, South, From the Other Side, and Laban, involved direct references to racism, forced dislocation, and migration, and in the case of Laba, which she filmed in Israel, Ackerman expressed her diasporic inclination with a commentary that defined an impossibly ambivalent relation to Israel and to exile. When she made this, she claimed that unconsciously she must have looked for images that recalled prior histories of relocation. She became fully aware of the parallel track she was stepping into after watching the rushes. And she said, our imaginary is charged with Eastern Europe. At each phase, I felt a history, the camps, Stalin, denunciation. It is always the same thing that reveals itself, images of evacuation, of marches in the snow with packages towards an unknown place, faces and bodies placed one besides the other. However, Ackerman's indirect approach to history her desire to have it function as an undercurrent in the film's present does not not start with the documentary work from the 90s. In Meetings with Anna, we see already signs of her strange relation to Germany and Eastern Europe. The film articulates the mix of curiosity and defamiliarization for Germany in all of its intricate post-Holocaust reverberations. When scouting for location, Ackerman stated, for instance, that the food, the language were familiar to her, but that she felt towards Germany a sort of rejection. Besides the scenes around food quite explicit in this regard, I want to draw your attention to one particular scene, a long tracking shot of Anna wandering the length of the train, graphically registering the filmmaker's fraught relation to East Europe. This scene condenses the conflicting feelings the filmmaker herself registers around crowd and trains more than a decade later with Dest. And I show here an excerpt from Dest. Um, what is striking in this excerpt is the filmmaker's presence, physically entering the deep space of the cars, but also laterally scanning the train cars until she, in this case, Anna um, Ackerman's surrogate, becomes enmeshed with other travelers in the crowded car. And in Dest, uh, this last excerpt, once again her camera glides and the shot's length magnifies the length of the waiting, as well as of the crowds, amplifying the temporal and historical resonance of their displacement. 
In this, rather than showing discrete national borders, the film has the viewer bordering landscapes and faces in a direct confrontation. So this kind of scanning of the surface that we feel because of the length of the shot is something that I feel in meetings with Anna, of course, you have that scene in which the glass partition creates that sense of separation. It's very important for her. Under the camera's protracted pressure, the surfaces of the present yield a disturbing echo of past histories. And indeed, Ackerman's long takes and her insistent gaze on particular events, situations, becomes her way of exfoliating other historical associations, of creating a mental space for the viewer's own resonances. I have characterized Ackerman's aesthetic as a hyper-real aesthetics, focusing on the ways that after looking at lengths to an image, the viewer's perception oscillates between seeing both what the image refers to and to its shape and formal attributes. Here, uh, with Dest and Mutings with Anna, I want to stress Ackerman's way of activating the scene's historical layers. In Meetings with Anna, these reverberations between past and present are conveyed primarily through her dialogues and their echoing qualities. It is Meetings with Anna's dialogue structure that instructs us about the filmmaker's ambition to create a work in which history and geography do not form the backdrop for individual stories and become instead temporal and spatial strata of personal collective narrative. In uh, something I've written before, The Echo and the Voice, I suggested that Anna's attentive listening enacted Ackerman's relationship to two dimensions of her personal life, her closeness to her mother and the lingering effects of a European Jewish history expressed by her mother's silence and her refusal to mention what happened in the concentration camp where the mother's parents perished. In meetings with Anna, Ackerman stages a minimalist Jewish history through a contrast between a nomadic character who preserves her voice and autonomy and moves on, and those whom she meets who plaintively channel the weight of history, the echo, demanding that she stay. Thinking of Ackerman's own sensitivity to her mother's charged silences, it is important to pay attention to the content but also to the tone of the extended speeches directed at Anna. Each encounter triggers a melange of European malaise, complaints about the recession, this is the 70s, disillusionment and personal confessions. As you'll notice, the juxtaposition of the personal and historical registers in the dialogues is strained and they seem to clumsily force major issues onto intimate revelations. Note, for instance, that either someone says something everyone knows, a platitude or a cliché, or they repeat the same idea again and again, repeating even the word again. This repetitious quality immediately raises the question of what is actually communicated in these dialogues. Heyrich's speech and a bridge history of Germany, uh, which I'm going to show here, is especially telling in this regard. Rather than conveying any real information, the fragments of German history he spouts are well-known markers of crisis, high points in a generic knowledge of European history, shared not only by Heinrich and Hannah, but by a whole post-Holocaust consciousness. Additionally, his speech, better than any, exemplifies what Ackerman attempts to do, the equation of personal and historical matters. As you'll see, his speech moves from an intimate revelation of his private life to history. Uh, he recites historical milestones in the same monologue as he relays his wife's abandonment. Though this way, his speech on national history releases not meaning, but the affect or emotional tone of a bedside story. Key here is the refrain in French, et puis, uh, and then, and then, and then, as you'll see in the um, subtitles. This sort of exchange yields an interesting paradox. The length of the monologue implies that what is said is relevant, but Ackerman flattens the dialogue so each encounter, and I'm talking about all the encounters we're going to have here, has the same weight. Relying on recitation and on cliches, she creates instead a parallel register for verbal reception, 
a chant-like tone that, like music, subtly bridges the personal collective registers of one's experience. Each encounter involves a plausible uh, persona account, but what matters is their common and plaintive monotone. Ackerman frequently stated that what interested her in dialogue is that it rounds up with a rhythm, a psalmody, a litany where the meaning of the phrases does not make sense. These rounded assertions, often linked by and then, 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 invoke an affect of wariness and comfort that Ackerman associates with Jewishness and Jewish religion in particular. She compares it with a biblical murmur, and what she heard when going to the synagogue with her grandfather, everywhere, she says, there was the same rhythm. When the film came out, its dialogues were especially criticized for their platitudes. But rather than expecting actual historical information, we should think of how they activate an effective temporal layer in this course. The historical dimension, personal and collective, telegraphed in what Heinrich, Ida, the trained passenger she meets, and Daniel say, creates in its reduced content a pervasive sense of wariness. And I'm basically asking that you see the film in total, this, each of these uh, monologues adding to the other cumulatively, because Ackerman's work operates that way. And yet it would be deceptive to match this wariness to Anna's stillness as she listens to them, for this character's despair is in fact a foil for Anna, who is represented as a self-contained person that finally passes on. Ackerman's aesthetic appropriation of her Jewish inheritance becomes clear then also dramatically. The film illuminates the nature of Anna's difference by pitching two forms of verbal address against each other. The echo, the five characters' plaintive monologues loaded with reverberations of the past, and Anna's singular voice. In order to demarcate Anna from the people she meets, Ackerman uses two important anti-naturalist strategies. The camera remains on both characters as one character talks and the other listens. The length of the speech creates an instability in the film's verbal mise-en-scene so that for long stretches of time, Anna becomes a relay for the audience. Another important aesthetic principle is to avoid over-identification or manipulating the viewer's feelings. To retain one's autonomy, be it as a character or the viewer, was paramount for the filmmaker. So, um, after working on Ackerman's meeting with Anna, I started noticing that both in modern post-war and in contemporary cinemas, there were a number of films where one character addresses at length and repeatedly a silent in-scene listener. Besides The Silence of the Sea, which I'm going to show uh, an excerpt by Jean-Pierre Melville, a film that uh, was started in... Um, 47, finished in 49, and Manuel de Oliveira's The Talking Picture, I believe it's from 2001 or two, and Abbas Karistami 10. We can also mention Rossellini's Socrates, which based on Plato's dialogues goes of course to the root of the philosophical dialogue. I want briefly to explore the effects of this um, Serial talkies, as I call them, a hybrid genre straddling mimetic drama and the treatise or expose. In contrast to essay films by Godard or Chris Marker, films in which the narrator directly talks to the audience um, or exercises uh, their subjectivity, serial talkies introduce ideas dramatically through characters. Moused by a character, the long-winded dialogue fits basic require, requirements of very similitude. It defines a character and advances the plot. But three factors can lend this one-sided conversation a rhetorical quality. Its uninterrupted length, its content repeatedly circling around one idea, and finally, its de-dramatized tone, its monotone. Like a sermon or harangue, it relentlessly comes back to a single topic in consecutive waves of speech aimed at edifying the listener. My interest in this unbalanced form of dialogue lies in its proselytizing impetus, such dry, de-dramatized 
Talkies. This film's manifest a pedagogical impulse shaped not by oratory peaks, but by a flatter line constructed out of a series of equally long speeches, whose thematic as well as affective tone accumulates progressively. You may or may not have seen the films uh, that I'm referring to, uh, and what follows you know, from now on is only a template for further reflection. So in Silence of the Sea, uh, Melville's film uh, is uh, adaptation of the famous resistant novel by Vercors. Uh, the narrative proceeds through a series of speeches by von Embernack, an officer, a German officer stationed at a French family's house during World War II. He comes down every evening to speak about the prospects of a marriage between Germany and France. He talks about their distinct literary and musical traditions and formulates his version of Greater Europe. All serial monologue films are dramatically plausible. So every night after speaking, von Ebrenack politely bids an old man and his niece, the French uh, people who uh, live in the house, good night, leaving the room. And these entrances and ex exits frame basically the series of monologues. Um, so they key the scenes repetitions as well as their theatricality. So I'm going to show one of the scenes um, from Silence of the Sea here for you. The film has important parallels with meetings with Anna, in particular the silence of the host who never respond, and the opaque, minimal expressions of the French young woman who listens but never addresses the officer. This silent resistance, a trope justified in the context of French political resistance during the war, appears in meeting with, with Anna through Anna's resistance to national and patriarchal grounding. Yet another echo, a filmic one, interestingly complicates meetings with Anna's unsettled portrait of Europe provided by Heinrich, and in particular the absence of any direct reference to the Holocaust in his speech. I never had a chance to directly ask Ackerman whether Silence of the Sea was an important reference for her, but Heinrich's account is strikingly similar to Werner von, Werner von Ebrenach's last speech about the true nature of collaboration with Germany in Silence of the Sea. So uh, Werner, at one point in the story, realizes that uh, his fantasy about the Union of Europe is um, uh, belied by what he sees the, his Nazi um, military people uh, talking about. And, um, and the most virulent of them is a friend of his, that he then comes back to the family in his last speech and talks about that he was basically misguided in his vision. Um, he also mentions a best friend with whom he shared poetry and music. And I found this very, very interesting, this parallel of the reference to a friend uh, who then turns um, an enemy of the state, or in this case, a Nazi. Um, and appears as the most vocal person to mock his ideas about a Franco-German union. Similarly to Werner's pain for losing his friend to, dialog to ideological causes and a nostalgia for a German history that did not happen, Heinrich, in meetings with Anna, ends his address to Anna by linking his best friend's fate to that of the country. Maybe that's what they call an enemy of the state. Heinrich states referring to Hans being put in prison. Heinrich's rhetorical question, what have they done to my country, uh, needs to be seen as a response of sorts to Werner's desperate awakening to the true Nazi mindset at the end of the Melville's film. If von Ebrenach's incredible naivete about the future of Europe under the Nazis is essential for the dramatic curve leading to his final awareness of German occupation, Heinrich's avoidance of any mention to Jews could be seen as disingenuous all too curiously avoided in his spouting of a roster of main markers of 20th century German history. But scripted by Ackermann, the avoidance of a direct mention of Jews in meetings with Anna spreads over the film a soft mantle of forgiveness. The soft despair associated with the long list of events that befell Germany spouted by Henrik warrants from Anna a sympathetic nod and a hug. 
It is as if Ackerman replied 30 years later to von Ebernach's desperate avowal to his French host in Melville's film. This monologue echo between the two films indi indicates the broad significance radius of The Silence of the Sea. It shows that the central image of resistance figured in Melville's film, that of, a na that of naive monologues met by silent non-compliance, is indeed a perfect find a formal model to stage and maintain the conceptual and dramatic pressure of unresolved questions. The affinity between the two monologues should be seen then as a proof of the staying suspended power of reduced dialogue, or, in this case, monologues. Questions will remain compelling once on screen auditors are silent. Excessive talking in the talking picture um, by Manuel de Oliveira is a way to place certainty and knowledge in question. Uh, the film deploys two figures omnipresent in other modernist film lessons, the historian and the naive listener, in this case a mother and her small daughter, taking a Mediterranean cruise. Again, as in other serial monologue films, there is a frame for the series. Uh, in this case, each port arrival and departure starts with a scene of goodbye wavings and a shot of the ship's uh, prow. Each of the ports will merit a history lesson. So here you have uh, this uh, waving um, with people embarking in each uh, port and uh, a shot of the sea, it's probably the same shot <laughs> each time, I imagine, uh, framing uh, the different ports that she uh, stops and talks to her daughter. The film is incredibly uh, interesting in other regards, um, of course, but um, don't have a chance to go into that now. Um, again, um, okay. Uh, each of the ports will merit a history lesson. So, uh, extended dialogues often fulfill their theatrical defamiliarizing vocation by relaying information that seems excessive. It is either unnecessary or misplaced in film. In the serial films, this prolixity is often accompanied by an informational redundancy, a peculiar reliance on the commonplace. Characters frequently spout known facts and their speeches become like so many litanies of received wisdom heard in the pontificating and nagging voices of lecturers, tour guides, or family. Funnily enough, in this film we have a few tour guides because it's a touristic film, in a way. Uh, serial dialogue films slip into commonplace knowledge precisely once the dialogues aim for grander historical statements. Platitudes and the naive auditor, these are the two sine qua nons of the parabolic trajectory of these narratives, poisoned between drama and lesson. The simplicity advocated by Brecht for the Lear st stuck uh, encompasses both the protagonist and the language addressed to him. In his compressed theory of modern drama, Peter Zondi, uh, suggests that the crisis of naturalist drama, the desire to talk about society and social issues, breaks the dramatic form leading to the epic theater. Given that in cinema there's always a possibility to go outside the parlor room, serial address films raise the questions of what his, this modified interpersonal exchange means in the cinema. How is the insistence on conventional drama and interpersonal exchange squared with the attempt to articulate a broader statement on contemporary or historical reality. This leads us to a question intrinsic to the mode uh, I am trying to define. Uh, let me just show this one scene. Okay, um, so this leads us to a question intrinsic to the mode I'm trying to define, this idea of how do you do conventional drama and also a kind of amplified, his, bring out an amplified historical question or some other question. Um, in every film, the use of extended speech is justified in the story. Werner needs to conquer his French host's resistance. They need to resist. Several of the characters are proselytizers of one shape or another. The mother in the talking picture is a teacher. They cross guides and various explainers. 
Still, each exchange around major ports in the Mediterranean, the violent history they map is, because of the series, they become equated to each other. And cumulatively, they become an allegory of Western civilization. What tips these serial monologue films from storytelling into a conceptual register is the film's cumulative repetitive serial structure. In addition, this thematic redundancy is compounded by a monotone performance. <coughs> no matter who speaks, they do so in an equally deflated monotone. This modernist strategy to de-dramatize the narrative works cre um, creates, in this case of serial address films, a parallel uh, resonance chord. Feminist for the exchanges in Abbas Karistami's 10, or political in the case of the silence of the sea, and in meetings is with Anna, as we've suggested, the monotone resonances are Jewish. We can discuss the conceptual implications of the serial dialogue film later, after the screening. For now, and before we watch meetings with Anna, I want to bring one more reference, uh, since I, I, I decided to do this presentation thinking about not only the echoes internal to the film from one uh, monologue to the other, uh, but also the kinds of uh, allusions or references that I saw from other films in Ackerman. And one of them is... Um, Gertrude by Carl Theodore Dreyer, a film that Ackerman claimed for a long time as her favorite film. Um, so there are no direct relations between the films, but both meetings with Anna and Gertrude make a very strong point about women's autonomy. Gertrude, uh, the Dreyer film from 64, is structured as a five-act piece with several meetings with the man in Gertrude's life and her progressive decision to reject them. Often either Gertrude or the man speak at length. Often they are in the frame together, standing or sitting frontally to the camera, very much like you're going to see with meetings with Anna. Um, in the film, uh, there is one particular scene in which Gertrude sings, um, accompanied by a lover that um, she has just... Um, discovered that he betrayed her. Um, so he's playing the piano and uh, she faints. It's, a, it's probably one of the most beautiful scenes in the history of cinema. In my view, it's pretty striking. Um, now, what this has to do with the film is uh, the singing. Um, Ackerman was someone who, um, she, um, lent uh, to scenes in which people sing a quality of imperfection. She herself sang out of tune. So very often in her films, the people sing because they like to sing, but not because they sing necessarily well at all. Uh, so we're going to have here a scene in which Anna sings. Uh, she's dressed in a robe, a white robe, which uh, Gertrude is a black and white film, but she is dressed in white. There is something very, very moving. Uh, if you get a chance to see Gertrude again, or if you haven't seen, um, about the kind of tremulousness, uh, you know, when we think about Ackerman, we think about this very, very strict, orderly shots. But towards the end of the film, things start becoming more emotional and more moving, e even with the way uh, camera moves, etc. So, um, so that's it. Um, this desire to sing, even if one's voice sounds distorted. I guess one of the things that I wanted to emphasize in this introduction is this idea of a tone and of the idea of how Jewishness is encompassed in this memory that she has of a, of a certain murmur. Na, 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 na. She often talks about this, and you're going to listen to this in each of the speeches. This against, of course, Anna herself singing at the end. Okay, thank you. So thank you very much, Yvonne, uh, for this lovely introduction. And we're going to have now the 10-minute pause, and then we continue with the screening of the meetings with Anna. Thank you. Uh, 
thanks, Laura, and, and thank you, everyone, uh, for staying for the Q&A. Um, might just give people a few seconds to leave yeah. in an orderly fashion, and then we can uh, get right into it. Um, so maybe the first question, Yvonne, that I wanted to pose to you, I thought uh, your concept of the serial monologue, a very fascinating idea, a very rich idea, one that can be extended well beyond this film, as you already gestured in your, in your lecture, uh, to many other films, many other filmmakers. But to stick to Le Rendezvous de Anna um, initially, uh, I guess one, one thing I found interesting, well, actually in this film, but also in, in some of the other examples you showed, uh, is so often these monologues seem to take place across linguistic boundaries. That is to say there are people uh, speaking in a language that is not their own, here we see, you know, German speaking French. Also, the case in the uh, Melville film, yeah. you showed, uh, and then of course the talking picture, the magnificent scene with John Malkovich and the four actresses. Exactly. In that case, all speaking their own language, but somehow understanding this across like five different languages. Uh, but this film, it seems very striking that there is this linguistic boundary that is being crossed uh, in in various different directions. Um, in the film, could you maybe talk about the multilingual nature of the of the serial monologues? That's that's. I hadn't thought about that in relation to the serial monologues, but I I certainly, uh, in terms of Ackerman, she is always very very interested in things that don't run smooth. You know, the off key with the singing is an example, and of course accents are another example. Of that, and that's something that uh, in the Deleuze and Guattari, uh, you know, beautiful little book, they talk a lot about language um, as a sort of um, languages that you speak that are uh, you are in within a majoritarian language. And in the case of Kafka, you know, uh, Czech, uh, but speaking German, which was the the, the main language there and and the whole thing of what that um, uh, uh, translation from one language to the other impo impoverishes your own language because you have a reduced vocabulary but then in the point that they make is that that reduction of vocabulary makes each of the words that you use have a certain greater intensity. And I know I mentioned here the, the cliches and the platitudes. We tend to think of that as reduced information, reduced content. But I do think that I do think that what Ackerman meant with it and what I would like to mean with it is in line with what Deleuze and Guattari talk about, which is there is something uh, of the quality of the, well, the cliche is repeated for a reason, because it resonates across time. So it is repeated, and you may joke about it saying, of course I know, but what you have to think is why is it that we repeat? So that whole conversation with Ziegler, Ziegler in the train in which she says, yes, they say only D, only D. You know, I find that conversation very beautiful because, yes, he's saying everything we know. It's hot and humid in Latin America. You know, French, France is the, the country of freedom. We all know that. But the reason why we repeat, and it's like a song. Why is it that a song is repeated? So I think that there is this quality that she is touching, and I think they're touching, having to do with affect. So I think that maybe, and I'm not answering your question, but I, I think I'll still want to think about it, is that the, the accents are a version of this, I don't know, not smooth uh, one language. You know, you're like adopting different languages. And of course, for Ackerman, nomadism is very much connected to being Jewish, but it's a value for her. It has to do with the value of like a cultural being that just traverses different worlds, and I think that that's very maybe part of that. There, I do think that the examples, though, uh, that I gave, um, and you're right in talking picture. I don't know how many of you have seen the film, but there is like the really nutty dinner conversation 
with all major, major um, stars of um, European cinema uh, speaking. Under, all, all of them understand Greek suddenly. Yeah, right? <laughs> even, well, it's the idea is that they all understand every language that is being spoken perfectly. So yeah. they feel confident into speaking their own language, including Greek, which is yeah. completely improbable. Exactly. So I think that each of these cases have to be taken in the context of each filmmaker and what is it that they're doing with that. You know, I don't want to like close the the idea and completely um, equalize all these examples at all with this idea of the serial monologue. But I guess what I wanted to to bring out was this idea of this form in between uh, drama, dialogue, and that ambition that I quoted from her right from the beginning. Behind insignificant events, you know, we'll see the shape of uh, big history. You know, this is the ambition of great novelists, right? Is the ambition of a, a Balzac or a Stendhal. You know, in cinema, it's much harder to pull off. And I think that she's trying, and I think that that's what I wanted to, to try to think about in relation to when you're doing monologues, you are stretching a form that is supposed to have a very natural back and forth into something else. And what is that doing to the writing? I guess the other thing I wanted to call attention here, and I was seeing the film with you, because when you sit down with an audience, you actually kind of sense the audience, and I was thinking, so much I didn't talk about in the presentation. You know, this film is, of course, well, I'll let you talk about it, but I think that it's a very, you know, it's it's a moment of disillusionment. It's 10 years after 68. Danielle's monologue is very much a reflection of that. You know, he's become like, uh, I don't know, like maybe some... He's become part of power, right? Part of power, and he completely doesn't know what to do with that, exactly. So there is a lot to talk about the film besides the idea of the monologues. I guess that's what I wanted. To just, a, uh, just to stay with the monologue for a second. Yeah. I found it interesting that you brought up uh, the novel uh, as, a, as a point of comparison because it's something that the novel does. Uh, it can do extremely long monologues, and as a reader, we kind of accept that. Uh, but when transposed onto the film screen, it becomes a lot more difficult for the spectator to digest. Yeah. Um, you know, that because we are, we aren't in control of it, we can't like, you know, can't like put the book down and then take it up again. Like we are just confronted with uh, that monologue as an indivisible block. Yeah. Um, yeah. That's 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 quite true. Um, I, when I started thinking about this thing of serial monologue, I started paying attention to normal conversation, and we do tend to talk more like that than not. You know, it's not usually complete back and forth. There is a lot of long stretches. And I think that to kind of fulfill my rules of the serial monologue is not just the extended, the extension of the talk, but it's the circularity of it. It's the return to a certain idea that's repeated again and again. And it's the uh, accumulation throughout the film of a certain tonality and a certain content, in fact, that I think moves the film into a different realm from drama into something else. Um, and I think with meetings is, with Anna, it's more subtle than with Silence of the Sea. Uh, but of course, the, subtle, the subtlety has to do with the fact that we, for instance, never hear the word Jew here in this film. <laughs> I mean, we understand that she understands German because of Yiddish. We understand that when she says Judith and Rebecca, you know, these are Jewish names. You know, we get all of that. And, of course, you get more if you read about it. Um, but there is something very... Um, I don't mean perverse in a perverse way, but there is something a little bit perverse in eliminating the direct reference and having it there throughout uh, in those different ways, like the relationship with the food or uh, the scene that I showed of her gliding through the train and getting to a point in which it's too crowded. 
um, which I think that when she starts doing the desk, uh, the, the, the documentaries, that she becomes much more, she's getting much more aware of uh, the parallels in history between uh, great migrations and, of course, her own history or the Jewish history. You know, she's doing all these parallels. Um, so, yes, I guess I'm di divert diverting here. Um, yeah, well, there, I mean, there seems to be this interesting parallel in the film between those great migrations. Uh, you spoke about this kind of historical events of populations being displaced due to wars. Yeah. Um, political uh, events and so on and so forth, and then this kind of trajectory that Anna takes, which is you know, in a kind of directionless, floating through these different spaces. Yeah. Uh, it's not a migration in that sense, and it's not—it's not goal or it's not fleeing something or trying to get somewhere. It's just—it just seems to be a drifting. I think that uh, you know, I—I was—I was very. Um, pleasantly surprised when I read uh, the fact that she felt she recognized herself in the Kafka book. I had read the, the Liz and Guattari Kafka book and I had loved it and then when I saw she making reference to it. So this idea of nomadism, you know, of course there is a lot of fleeing and, and you know, fleeing some catastrophe or disaster. Uh, that's not what she means exactly by it with the character of Anna. So I think you're right. Anna has a quality of mutant, of being a mutant, even physically. <laughs> I find that when you look at her, you know, there is something. Uh, it, it's caught a little bit when she passes through those doors that open and the hair floats, you know, the hotel doors. There is something a little bit ethereal or, or strange about her. Uh, the other thing I didn't mention is that when she talks, she verges on... She verges on the retard. <laughs> I hate to use this word, but there is something weird. She rephrases things. People don't talk like that. She is rephrasing things. Why is my mother calling to the reception of the hotel? Did you know there is something always in excess, like the 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 tie, right? So. It's not just the excessive long monologues. When she talks, it's also kind of strange. It's off, right? So in part, that's, uh, you know, she has an anti-naturalistic aesthetics. She complained about the fact that both Leah Massari, who plays her mother, and Daniel, who is played by uh, Jean Cassel, that they had uh, too much of a naturalistic performance. And you see that Lemasari, yeah, Lemasari moves too much. You know, she punctuates too much. Um, okay, I think Vincent's. Yeah, whereas Hans Tischler plays in wonderfully. <laughs> um, Who? Hans Tischler. Oh, Hans. Yeah. Um, I have two things, and, and they're sort of on topic and off. Uh, the, the first one is on topic, off topic. The second one is on topic. Um, I'm curious about the choice of location. Um, Essen <laughs> is not a trivial choice if you are telling a story that has that is somehow connected to the Holocaust I mean um, one reason to choose Essen would be the cinema because it has one of the largest movie palaces in Germany and the, the name of the cinema by the way is not Roxy but Lichtburg uh, which is the, the, the fortress of light um, but in any case but, but Essen of course is the corporate headquarters of Krupp um, uh, which is the epitome of industrialist Nazi collaboration. And uh, the, the, the head and owner of Krupp actually served eight years in prison as a war criminal after the war. So um, I was wondering if you know, knew something about the, the choice of location. She could have gone anywhere in Germany or, you know. What uh, In terms of location, what was important for her when she started writing this film, she wanted to make a film uh, in which the character, who is loosely based on her on herself, um, had this co confession with the mother, right? And she said that she was very blocked by this idea because she didn't want this to become dramatic. So what does she do? <laughs> she creates other encounters, and she puts the mother in the middle. So for me, uh, the trajectory here 
has to do with Germany. She definitely wanted Germany, uh, but she wanted Brussels to be a point in the middle there. And I don't know how much this geographically makes sense because I don't know. Exactly. It's pretty much in the middle. Yeah. So I think that, um, you know, I find it very, very interesting, this idea of equalization, uh, how she equalizes each monologue. And it has to do truly with de-dramatizing something that she wants to do, which is key for her, this uh, major scene with the mother, but she doesn't want it to appear big. Of course, it's the only scene that she talks, as opposed So, of course, it's already big in that, right? But it's a very, very interesting, for me, this kind of modular thinking uh, in terms of how she structured the film. And, and, and the other thing concerns uh, uh, something that, that you can follow throughout the film, which is media technology, telephones, radios, televisions. Answering and, machine. And the then in the end, is. of course, the answering machine, which is a mechanical anthology of serial monologues. Of course, of course, uh, yeah. Without any response, yeah. It is It is just completely brilliant. And this is another thing, you know, we were talking about vendors before. I, I truly adored vendors up to a point. So I'm, I'm not throwing out entirely, you know. But, but this kind of imagery of the TV uh, with static, with nothing, appears in absolutely every 70s films. I mean, there is not, you know, it's, you can count how many 70s films are there with that with that image and it's and the miscommunication and the difficulty of communication this is all there and i think it's part of the accents too you know the not reaching yeah there's a way that the uh profusion of monologues kind of compensates for this inability to communicate exactly um to return to the uh the monologue with the mother um i mean there are a few things that it evoked for me one was uh, I, I don't know how direct an influence this was, but uh, it seems to be inspired, at least in part, by a film that is probably one of the great serial monologue films, Persona by Bergman, where you have a similar kind of uh, telling of a you know, kind of erotic encounter, um, and it's kind of, uh, but but through the means of this this monologue that just kind of goes on and on and on. Yeah. Um, and then the other the other resonance that that scene has, I think, for us today is uh, no home movie, yeah. and you know the kind of uh, Chantal Ackerman's return to the thematic of how she kind of relates to her mother. Yeah. Well, the mother, um, you know, if you have read anything about Ackerman, the mother has become like a big theme uh, from a certain point. Um, at this point, when she made meetings with Anna, um, uh, the, as I mentioned, the Jewish thing, which is the big relationship with the mother and the fact that the mother didn't talk a lot about um, her mother's experience, the mother's mother experience in uh, a concentration camp, um, you know, perishing there and, um, you know, that kind of, the, the imprint of that silence on Ackerman and Ackerman's characters is becomes more and more clear uh, later on. She made a film right after this, which was a film commissioned for French TV called Dis-moi, Tell Me, and it's from the series Grandmother, Grandmothers, and a lot of great directors, I think, made one themselves there. And she made one which she visits three Jewish um, ladies and uh, talks to them about their mothers who died. So, and in Off, she talks to her mother. Her mother never appears in that film but her mother's voice appears. So she talks to her mother about her mother's mother's death, and she talks with other mothers, which are grandmothers, you know, about, so it's about grandmother. So that film is 1980, and I'm mentioning this because the whole idea of testimonial, you know, of course we show uh, the big testimonial film, that's 85. So it's, she's already starting this idea of testimonial without perhaps 
the grand weight of like, oh, I'm making a film, I want people to talk about what they lived through, but she's doing it, and she's doing it through this vein of the personal, and she's doing with her mother off frame. And I'm mentioning this because the whole issue if the mother is inside or outside is very big for Ackerman, as we know from News From Home. In News From Home, the mother's letters, she reads them, but she is in New York. So the mother's letters are in the present, but dislocated. So this dislocation is very important for her of the mother. Here, it's putting the mother at the center, but trying to equalize. Um, and no home movie is a whole other ball game, I think. It's, it's very big, and of course, it's her last film. It wasn't meant to be her last film, but she was very conscious that the film was very different. She said, uh, I spoke with her before, and she said this film is different. It's, it's direct, it's too direct. And she wanted that. She felt it was good that it was direct. When you look at the film, I don't know how many people saw it. Is, is it showing? We're showing it in July next year. The last okay. film. Okay. Well, don't want to talk too much about the film if you haven't seen. But in any case, the film is much more constructed than you would imagine with the idea of the whole movie. It's actually a, a pretty pure, constructed Ackerman film. Very clearly brilliant and, you know... Um, so I wrote about the film in, in the uh, film quarterly. So that's, I, I basically co-edited the issue so I could control who was writing about the film. <laughs> I wanted to be able to write about that film. So, um, so I, don't, I did not answer you, I guess. But um, any questions from? We have a microphone here if anyone's keen to ask something. Impressions, impressions about the film, or yeah, other ideas you had. Sorry, it was amazing. It, ju it was just very striking for me how much she looked like herself. I like mean, maybe there her oh, car. Oh, absolutely. Just crazy. I was Abs watching the videos on YouTube and just yeah, like her. Uh, yeah, yeah. Or like as if it was like a a younger version of herself or something. The choice of actors. Absolutely. I'm glad you mentioned this because the other big. Uh, actor for her is Stanislas Mehar and um, very striking blue eyes all of them I mean Ackerman is known for this amazing blue eyes and um, you know and there is something about the last shot in um, uh, La Folie au Maillère uh, which brings this up a lot this idea of this for me you're the first person mentioning this. I mentioned with friends. I never, you know, heard anyone talking about this. But yes, I, I agree. Great, thank you. Um, do you know much about, I mean, the way the film was received at the time uh, in terms of how directly it was read as, as a confessional of Ackman herself? Or? Um, there was a lot of uh, discussion about... I mean, there, there are two kind of tiers of writing. Of course, there is the reviews, which a lot of people uh, misunderstood what she was trying to do and thought, you know, these dialogues are weird. <laughs> you know, she doesn't really mesh the, the grand events with the personal. Um, you know, that's the big ambition, and that's what I think she does. I actually think that this film announces her as a writer because we have so much writing and if you think about it the men in particular are completely amazing and what the women say about their men is also amazing i mean this is a film that has an amazing sensibility about women and men's roles and how women rebalance men ida with her husband um, her mother with her father, and then Daniel and uh, Heinrich, you know, the kind of loneliness, male loneliness. I mean, there's something quite... The, the, the mention she makes of um, the shaving, 
and the kind of thought that comes with the shaving. You know, this is, you know, unbelievable writing. You know, it's like coming into a character, creating a character, you know. So I think that this film is a film that shows one of the things she wanted to do is to write, and she ended up do writing a couple of novels that are pretty brilliant. So um, this is there already. Um, what was the other thing you mentioned? Um, I don't know, anything more about the reception? Or? Oh, the reception, yeah. So I said there were two tears. So there was this complaint about, oh, it's awkward. These are people who don't understand that Ackerman is not going to be doing a naturalistic film. You know, Romare was complaining around the same time that he couldn't bear how uh, in late 60s and 70s, people were talking in the movies. He just couldn't bear. He said there was a lot of like, huh, mm, mm, you know, like, so he cleaned all of that. He cleaned all those kinds of things that we do um, to emphasize or pauses. He cleaned that and his is his own anti-naturalism and she is doing hers. And if you are, um, I don't know, a reviewer that's not attentive to this, you'll say, People are stiff. What's going on? You know, people. She, it's all weird. So she had those reviews. Uh, in terms of the confessions and the autobiography, a lot of the feminists uh, that follow her, the feminist critics, were started then trying to figure out how they would talk about the personal in her work because this was the most obvious film in which you had the autobiographical personal. Thing. And she always said, it's not me, it's a fictional character. So that, those were the two. But no one, it, it, ex, no one mentioned necessarily the confession, no. Okay. Um, another way in which the personal and the political kind of intermingle in the film is, I mean, something you have alluded to, uh, but uh, the fact that the character had two abortions. Yeah. Um, which is something that in, in France, I'm not sure about Belgium, but in France at least, uh, this is still a, a very like unspoken thing in the yeah. 1970s that you know, yeah. this is like, and yeah. it was something that was starting to come out and yeah. because we're starting to address it directly during this period. Yeah, yeah. Um, so it was really a, a terrain of, of political conflict about you know women's control of their own bodies. Um, yeah. So that's a, I mean, there's a way in which that's there's kind of a link drawn between the those very deeply personal traumas and this kind of grand historical Absolutely. traumatic event. Absolutely. I think, I think uh, this, is, this is quite true. And the other film that is also from 78 that matches this film very much is The Devil Probably by Bresson, which is not just one Daniel. <laughs> it's like all the characters are undergoing this um, moment. Bourdieu talks about that, this moment of like 10 years after 68, that everyone who was a revolutionary uh, suddenly are uh, in selling books, being a psychoanalyst or, you know, like the professions that this Media star, do. like yeah. on talk shows. And stuff. Exactly. Yeah. So... Uh, this disillusionment is very, I find, very moving, how it appears here in the film. It's very abstract. You have no idea what's going on with Daniel. You don't know what he does, why he's so desperate. But she catches something from the period, I think, very um, strong. Um, and yes, I think there are lots of feminist points when she's, he says something like, every two hours, I'd love to be a woman, to be able to basically not do anything <laughs> and, and, and follow a different time. And she's correcting him continually, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, no, I mean, uh, there's also the, the monologue where uh, the, the German man talks about his friend who's kind of been declared an enemy of the state and sacked from his job. I mean, that seems also an allusion to what was happening in Germany around the, um, the the hot autumn and so on and so forth. Yes. So uh, I'm taking it background story is that the, the, the friend was a member of the Communist Party, which in the early 70s was enough for dismissal from, from public from service. Teacher, yeah. Yeah. And, and, and the background is that all the colonel laws, which was you know, much discussed at the time. So, but it's a very precise historical illusion. Um, the, it's interesting you bring up Bresson because I, I felt that the Bressonian quality in the film 
reached a kind of high point with that uh, the scene where they where the, where um, Anne and her mother say goodbye to each other and it's kind of just saying I love you to each other in this totally flattened. The um, mother says, "Tell me you love me." Yeah, it's just <laughs> it's <laughs> incredible. <laughs> yeah, she got something there. <laughs> Um, but there's also, I mean, for Bresson, it's those moments. It's 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 minimal. It's minimalism in, in that in the kind of expression that allows the kind of emotional peak to be achieved in the film itself. And I think absolutely. we have the same thing here. Absolutely. Right. Yeah. Um, the hotels. I mean, we talked about the media, but hotels are the other area here that are very typical of this kind of transience and I know you did your lab with the airport but you know it's the same thing you know it's the sensibility for those spaces of transit they choose twice the hotel and today I was thinking my god when she and the mother are choosing the hotel they seem to be choosing the kind of hotel that she refers to in the Edith Piaf song that she's talking about the kind of hotel that this couple goes to commit suicide you know it's like it's a cheap hotel. That's the main characteristic of the hotel. It's a cheap hotel. So there's something um, strange about <laughs> percolating there. Yeah. It's a, the film is also an amazing documentary about the, the European railway system in 1978. Yeah. <laughs> so anyone's interested in that topic? <laughs> uh, <laughs> oh, that's true, yeah. um, any other questions from the audience? Yes. Sorry, I haven't thought about it much. It's just like a some a strong scene that stayed with me is the bit that she's doing the massage and then when she tries to kind of yeah. penetrate him or something. I think that's such a strong scene in again to kind of set this hierarchy of the positions and roles and Absolutely. I think that was so subtly done and just yeah. and then she leaves after that somehow. Yeah, and also the lying the, uh, uh, when he says lie on top of me, you know it's. You know, Ackerman is, uh, you know, the queen of, like, strange positions and, and scenes and sex scenes. I mean, you know, she was not, um, she didn't model anything on, like, any conventional vi vision that anyone would have of what it is to make love. Everything is unique there, so... No wonder that people talk in a unique way, that they move in a unique way, and that, yeah. But yes, you're right, there is all these little breaks there with Tabu. She asking the mother, did you ever think of another woman? And the mother says, no, I just never thought of it. It doesn't mean it didn't happen, it's just I never thought of it. There is something very interesting there, yeah. Um, Any more questions? Um, if not, maybe we'll call it a night. Um, thanks once again to Yvonne Margulies. Stimulating reading of yeah. Rendezvous with Dana. Thank you so uh, much. Yeah. Laura, can you tell us about the next The next, uh, as you probably already know, <laughs> on the 13th of December. Don't miss it. Claire Atherton is going to be here. She's the editor of most of Ackerman's films and she's going to be here. Uh, talking about the film Dest and I'm sure it's going to be a very impressive uh, experience to be able to talk to her about her work with Ackerman. So thank you once again very much, Yvonne, for coming and talking to us. Yes. Thank you very much, Daniel. Thank you.